Good evening and uh, welcome to PNP Live. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. We have a great program for you this evening with George Saunders in conversation with Anne Lamott. For those of you not familiar with how this virtual format works, uh, although you're not visible to us, you'll still be able to ask a question if you like. To do so, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. The chat function also will be active and in that column, you'll find a link for purchasing a copy of George's new book, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain. George, of course, uh, isn't only an immensely talented writer, but also one of the most influential and original authors of our time. I've introduced him at PNP appearances before and always like to note, uh, particularly for the benefit of uh, any budding writers out there who think getting to the top involves traveling in a straight line, George's own route has been rather circuitous. Uh, his college degree was in exploration geophysics. And after graduating, he worked in the oil fields of Sumatra and then spent time in the US in assorted odd jobs, including being a doorman, a roofer, a convenience store clerk, and a slaughterhouse worker. Eventually he discovered the world of MFA programs and got into one at Syracuse, uh, but he still needed to earn some money. So he worked as a tech writer for six years composing in his off hours several abortive books for producing his first one, Civil War Land in Bad Decline, and along the way, landing his first piece in The New Yorker. In the 25 years or so since, he cemented a reputation as a remarkable short story writer, one who has, in the words of the MacArthur Foundation that awarded him a genius grant back in 2006, a sense of humor, pathos, and literary style all his own. Three years ago, he came out with his first novel, Lincoln and the Bardo, a bold imaginative story that won the Man Booker Prize and was hailed as ingenious, mesmerizing, and unlike anything you've ever read. Now, in a, in a swim in a pond uh, in the rain, uh, George provides a, a sort of master class on literature and writing. Focusing on 19th century Russian short stories, he offers seven essays to show how great works uh, how great fiction works uh, and why his, its value is timeless. As many of you know, George has taught a class in the creative writing program at Syracuse since 1997. And if you read the book, you'll see why his teaching is so admired and popular. In conversation with George this evening will be Anne Lamont, also a celebrated writer of both fiction and nonfiction, whose works are known for their honesty, keen observations and humor. Her most recent book is Almost Everything, Notes on Hope, a best-selling collection of reflective essays. And her next, due out in March, uh, will be titled Dusk, Dusk, Night, Dawn on Revival and Courage. So George and Anne, the screen is yours. Thank you. Man. Thank you. Well, I love politics and prose and I love George. I've never met him and I love his work so much because of the generosity of heart and also the humor. He makes me laugh really hard. He surprises me. So it'll be this beautiful, elegant writing and then this impeccable comedic timing like pop rocks, if you know what those are. Um, so it's just an honor <laughs> and I'm just so happy to be with you. Oh. Um, I thought I'd start off by um, asking you just to tell us about the book for, for people who haven't gotten their copies yet. Uh, tell us about the book and your writing classes at Syracuse in both, in, in both of which you use great Russian short stories to teach writing. Sure. First, let me say um, I, I'm on the satellite internet way up in Oneonta, New York, so I know there's a delay and I, I apologize for that. I know the audio is pretty solid, so I'm going to try to be extra smart uh, to make up for how weird I look, which has kind of been the story of my <laughs> life so far. Um, also, let me say it's such, a, such an honor to be here with Anne. And I've, uh, ever since I read this beautiful classic um, all those years ago, I've been longing to have a conversation with you. So I'm so grateful that you agreed to do this and, and happy to be here. Uh, yeah, so I, I've been teaching at Syracuse since 96. And one of the cornerstone classes is this um, a forms class where we sort of take apart the Russian stories. Uh, and I, I say we kind of, you know, we're reading to see what we can steal. Uh, and I, the basic theory is that 
in addition to the workshop classes where I'm, you know, I'm editing student work and we're talking about that, this is a chance to kind of look at the, at the physics of the form. And I guess the background assumption is that if you take these things apart and you kind of, you know, uh, look on your own terms at how they work, that knowledge kind of seeps into your body somehow. I, I'm not really sure how it works. Uh, I don't think it ever hurts us. Um, so the idea is just to go almost like, you know, like story morgue, like, you know, put a great story on the slab, apologize to it. You know, I, I loved you, I admire you, now I'm gonna take you apart. And then just kind of see what we can learn about the basic, um, the basic physics that any story follow, you know, follows. In other words, why do we keep reading? Uh, if we're moved, why did, why did that happen? And as a former engineer, I'm kind of, you know, convinced that I'm a big believer in cause and effect. So if you feel something on page eight, you've been set up for it on the previous seven, and maybe we can lightly dig at that and just see, you know, see why. And the key thing I think is to convert that knowledge into something that is meaningful to the individual writers. It's not, there's no universal lesson to be drawn, but I think there's something magical that happens when you poke at it. Um, it might be, I think it's kind of akin to when a songwriter hears a beautiful song and then goes, wow, I love that so much. I have to learn the chord changes. You know, it's not the case that she's going to, you know, do exactly that, but she sort of has those in her hands then after that, you know. So, so that's kind of the idea of the book is just to go through these seven stories and kind of try to say, here's why I feel what I'm feeling. Do you, dear reader, agree? If not, that's great, but let's kind of huddle around these great works uh, and kind of see if we can get our two minds in communication with the mind of that long dead writer, something like that. Something like that. Well, um, you read along along with us in um, at part many parts of the book, and it's so amazing to read a page and a half, and then for you to say, "Did you notice what wasn't there?" Because that's very important. And um, and I wouldn't have noticed what wasn't there, but what wasn't there is su such a huge presence in our lives. You know, the the people who aren't here anymore, the absence of them. The, um, I heard someone say um, after her, um, her wife had passed a year later, she said, she's still a part of my song. And so the absence is just mm -hmm. so, it's such a beautiful kind of ache. And it's also mm -hmm. um, can be really kind of alarming and, and, you, and you sit up a bit, oh right, that should be here. Why isn't it? What does this mean? It helps you pay attention, which is really the secret of all life, I think, um, is to pay better attention and to yeah. try to be a little bit kinder. But um, my husband says you can learn and see and re rediscover all there is that is true about life in a 10 minute walk through the neighborhood if you're paying attention. And that was really the main thing I had to teach my students. And um, you know, you see the beauty, you see the, the cranky, crunchy people, you see the, the holy moments, you see the miracle, you see the nature, you see hardship, you see compassion, you see meanness, you, you see resurrection stories. If you're paying attention, hypothetically, you could see all of this in a pond in the rain, a man going for a swim, in a pond in the rain. And so in this story from which the title comes, Gooseberries by Anton Chekhov, um, I just wondered if you could read us that one long paragraph where Ivan dances um, on page 314. Sure. So there's just been two hunters, Ivan and his friend Birkin, and they've been uh, hunting and they got caught in a rain so they feel very grouchy and miserable and they go to a friend's house and the host invites them to um, bathe to take a swim in this uh, mill pond so and then this happens. Ivan Ivanich came out of the cabin plunged into the water with a splash and swam in the rain thrusting his arms out wide. He raised waves on which white lilies swayed. He swam out to the middle of the river and dived and a minute later, came up in another spot and swam on and kept diving, trying to touch bottom. By God, he kept repeating delightedly, by God. He swam to the mill, stoked to the peasants there, and turned back and in the middle of the river, lay floating, exposing his face to the rain. Birkin and Eljohan were already dressed and ready to leave, but he kept on swimming and diving. 
God, he kept exclaiming, Lord, have mercy on me. You've had enough, Birkin shouted to him. Oh, that's just wonderful. Um, you know, I notice that your characters, first of all, you have um, a lot more um, amputees than I do in my um, fiction. Um, but you, your characters and the Russian and the peasants and all of them are tired of being broke. You know, Bernie, sa and Bernie says in uh, CEO, some people got everything and I got nothing. Why, why did that happen? And she can't let that go. Why did that happen? Well, capitalism and, and her own decisions and her, the fearfulness that held her back and what she held on to and clenched and clutched. And, um, but then in the course of things, she's reduced basically to a pile of body parts wanting pie. And I thought, well, I would too. <laughs> and then I thought body parts and appetite that kind of says it all, you know, and yet when all is removed, something remains. And in the story with the man whose name neither of us are positive about how to pronounce, um, Alyosha or Alo Alosha, I think it's one of the Chekhov when his entire life has been about being a very, very good person doing everything. He's maybe simple, maybe not, maybe just kind of attentive. Um, maybe very present and maybe wanting just to help. And his entire life, he has been valued every so often for what he's able to do for the other people in the, on the property. And at the very end, in the last few sentences, while he's dying, he has a moment where you don't know and you don't say, and Chekhov doesn't say what it is he realizes, but he, it startles him. He takes a breath and passes. And I thought that what startles him is what is there when everything else is gone. Not just if you're Aunt Bernie and your body parts, but when, you, when you're terminal, when, you, when everything has been stripped away, that sacred moment of understanding that you are, you can be loved. Somebody has loved you. You have loved somebody. And in some real way, you just are love, <laughs> you know? And it's so yeah. beautiful, but that's what I made of it. And I wondered if you could talk about those lines at the end of the story. Yeah, I mean, that was an it's a beautiful story and it's written very late in Tolstoy's life. It's one of the last things he ever wrote. And so you talked earlier about omission, you know, what you leave out, uh, Tolstoy actually, you know, something that was rare for him, he left out his moral judgment in that story. It's kind of hovering over me. The way I interpret it in the, in the book is that he kind of leaves two contradictory readings of the story. And really, I think you can go either way. So in a sense, he does this kind of beautifully 20th century thing of, of the story turns the question back on the reader. So the story poses the question, is it good to go through life totally meek, believing in God's love, everything's for the best, or uh, is, it, is this a story of a guy who should have pushed back and didn't? And we keep leaning in, waiting for Tolstoy to tell us, and he never does. So every time I read the story, I, I'm sort of uh, reminded anew of how vital that question is. You know, we, is it better for us to be acquiescent and accepting of injustice and kind of try to keep our hearts clean? Or do you have to get in there and get, get dirty, you know? Um, but this is one of the things about all these stories that I, I, that I learned by writing this book is that they really don't, even though we think of the Russians as being very moral writers, they almost never will give you an answer. They just make the question bigger uh, mm -hmm. and they make the question more difficult to answer unequivocally, which you know, I would argue that's, a, that's an extremely moral thing to do is to keep saying, well, on the other hand, well, on the other hand. And then the, you know, the most lovely thing of all is at the end, they turn to us and they say, well, what do you, what do you, know, what do you think? Is this still a, a problem for you? Um, in the 21st century. And of course we, from our connection, we feel that, yeah, it, it is still a problem, you know. What do you think you, I know it's a, um, I get to answer the question for myself, <laughs> but I just wanna know mm -hmm. what you think he realizes in that moment, what startles him with the, the purity of that moment that pierces him 
Yeah. Pierces him in a good, in the beautiful way. What do you think? Yeah. Well, for for many years, I for many years I tossed a story that he was this acquiescent guy all his life, and at the very moment his habits drop drop away. You know, his 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 mind is dropped. Anyway, so his habits drop away and he goes, hey, God, I should have been more forceful. I should have loved, you know, seized this woman that I love and so on. But then I had a student point out to me that in a way that doesn't really agree with anything Tolstoy ever believed. You know, Tolstoy possibly meant this as a kind of a celebration of this really meek guy. So I actually don't know. I mean, still my as a contemporary reader, I want to read it the first way that at the last minute he realizes that he's kind of wasted his life. But textually, I'm not really sure that that's, you know, supported. But that for me, that was one of the, you know, the fun things about this book is to realize that, you know, if we have, I see now 234 people in the audience, and I'm guessing that many of them are writers or have thought about it or tried it. And for me, the great lesson of this book was that the tool that we have you know, to make our prose better are in those little micro moments where we decide whether we like the phrase or we don't, you know, those little, just little moments of, um, uh, where we become aware that we actually do have these tiny little bursts of taste in us uh, and that long, long process of learning to hear those and honor them, you know? And I think this goes for reading too. Like we can read a story like that Tolstoy one and notice the many different reactions we have and the many layers of reaction. And I think in the end, that's such an empowering thing, you know, to say, well, I have this mind with which I'm reading the story. I have to trust it. And all really good criticism is going to come from that move where you say, okay, I'm a working class person, or I'm uh, a busy person, or I'm someone who didn't go to college, or whatever I am, I still have a valid judging machine. And that's what I'm going to use to write with. And I, it's really the only thing I, I have, you know, so for me, the, the, the book was kind of a reminder that I do have a judging facility here. And whether it's right or wrong, it's the only one I have. And the process of becoming an artist is learning to trust that judging facility in every instant. And as you said earlier, that's a life skill, you know, to go into a situation and say, wow, I, I feel uncomfortable. Um, a less mature person might override that feeling or deny it, but yeah. someone who's an artist will, well, I feel this way. So that's where I have to start from. You know, this is something I actually, I've been reading, reading your book uh, this week. And it's so beautiful, the things you say in there about that really what we're asking our, our students to do is trust their own reactions, you know? Yeah which is a very big, beautiful human thing to, to learn to do. Or as Mel Brooks put it, listen to your broccoli and your broccoli will tell you how to eat it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my husband uh, talks about this profound moment we come to when we are blessed, when we are spritzed by a plant mister and 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 spurt and spritz awake for a minute and come to the realization of i don't know you know from thinking that we have good ideas thinking you know believing that figure it out is a good slogan believing that you know the buddhist you buddhist -y types would say do you want to be happy or do you want to be right you know and and i want i i believe i'm right and that's the source of most of my unhappiness when i when i um hook into that and, but he talks about that I don't know moment. And, and that's where you leave us in the Tolstoy. I don't know. I don't know. But it's, um, uh, I hate this word. I don't use it, but it's like transformative to go into the I don't know. And it really can be a key to the kingdom away from some idea or theory you come up with that you want to pass along because it's just, so much so brilliant and just so much smarter than the average bear and then you realize you know what i don't know what do you think i don't know it's a beautiful yeah. place to end but then i just wanted you to tell me <laughs> what the was. um yeah you know yeah and I, i've done um a lot of these nonfiction pieces like i did one where i drove the mexican border uh and you know try to out immigration and that moment you described is really the, the the golden ticket where after all this research and all my preconceptions and then all this data that i've accrued along the way you get enough data where your judging facility goes i really don't know you know yeah. in fact it kind of says it would be wrong to know. it would be a weaker position to know and then i always find that i can stay there for a very short time you know i i i have a kind of elation 
with that, along with an anxiety of what I'm going to write about when I get home. Uh, and then slowly that, you know, that feeling of wanting to be sure seeps back in. But I find that in that, in those trips, and also in writing fiction, I live for that moment where that judgment falls away just for a little bit, you know, because it feels very, to me, it feels very powerful and kind of, um, uh, it's actually a weird kind of confidence if you can, if you can get there. But it's, it's, isn't it amazing how your ego really likes to sit on a throne that says, I got it. And um, that yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't like being unseated. No, and it fights back. Um, you know, that moment um, reminds me of, of William Blake saying that we're here to learn to endure the beams of love. And I think in the last minutes of his life, he startles fully alive in the moment of his passing that he's been loved. He loved this girl, the cook, yeah. this young woman, and she loved him. She didn't want anything from him. He's had why we were born at all. He had it, he got it. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can, you know, it's also funny, there, there are some precedents. If you look in this book, there's a story called Master and Man, also by Tolstoy, yeah. in which a guy dies at the end. And then of course, the great death of Ivan Illich where Ivan dies. Yeah. And in both of those, I think what the person feels is that their self, you know, their habits and all that falls away and they're left face to face with, with God. And so I, I'm, I also am somewhat inclined to bring that forward to the Alyosha that maybe what happens is all of his you know, um, obsequiousness and his habitual um, lackitude, lackey quality drops away and then there's God's love, which actually we've seen, he's seen a little tiny taste of it earlier from yeah. that peasant girl, who, as yeah. you say, loved it for himself. So it's almost like he had a little bit of love and then he got the super size at the end. Yeah. And he recognized it partly because he'd known it in his life, you know. Yeah. Just great writers, you know, oh, what yeah. they can get you thinking about. Oh, I tell you, um, reading these, is it seven short stories, seven Russian short seven. stories, and then your response to them, your walking alongside us and your footnotes and your, and your essays at the end of them had two effects on me. One, it just filled me with self-loathing <laughs> about how inadequate. <laughs> I, I mean, to read Turgenev, I mean, forget it. I felt like Miss Nancy from Romper Room. And to read you and how brilliant and esoteric you are, I just felt, but then at the same time, because all, all truth is paradox, it made me feel like, ooh, that's right. That's exactly right. You ask, you ask what's going on here? What happens next? And it made me want to write again. It was funny because I do have a book coming out and I'm not writing much, just a very little and reading your, it was like you shined a little flashlight on certain sentences and stuff now. And they, they um, kind of startled me and they made me want to see if I could do that too, which is what I think a lot of great writing mm -hmm. does. But you know, you and I both teach. Well, before I go on to, to writing, I think probably a lot of the people here are write are writers and writing. And um, but before we get on into that, so why your love and obsession with Russian short story writers rather than say Central Americans or even North Americans? Why do you love these guys so much? Yeah, I. I do, I do, and I always have, and I don't really know why. And so at a certain point, I, you know, I taught um, this class when I first started at Syracuse, I taught it in, back in 97, and it was really fun. It was really, you know, I was learning right alongside the students. And then the next year I thought, okay, I'll switch it up and I'll teach the American short story. And I, I started with Poe and we came, and it was okay, but somehow I didn't, I just don't have the affinity for the, for um, even my favorite American writers that I do for these Russians. And so, what I noticed and, and kind of took to heart was that if you love a work of art, you teach it better. Yeah. So this was always my favorite class. I do American story and I'm not, I'm okay at it, but these really come alive for me. I think mainly because I was, you know, a working class uh, kid, didn't really um, have any thought of being a writer, didn't know any writers. And the first books that spoke to me were kind of self-help where they were kind of like, um, you know, Khalil Gibran and um, Zen and Yard or Motorcycle Maintenance. And then later, 
Uh, Ayn Rand, I thought that was a great guide for living. Uh, God help me. Uh, but that was my first understanding that the reason you read was to live better, you know? And then from there, I kind of crept over into, especially Steinbeck, who, who I could read yeah. the same way. And then these, these Russians seem to have the same kind of idea about things, you know? Yeah. You know who reminds me of these Russian writers, though, is um, the late, great Gina Berriolt, um, oh, who I don't think people yes. are reading anymore. But boy, she was a beautiful writer with the same kind of um, presence and, and um, uh, so much grief and just so much getting on with it, that we get on with it. When all is said and done, you do the next right thing. What's your choice? And the beauty of each of those sentences, you know, that each sentence you just kind of were grateful for, amazed by, and yet what she did, what your Russians, what you do is to make you want to read the next one, you know, and to, and to gobble it up. You know, up. that's so funny you should, you, you should mention her. I'm sorry, I'm, I know I'm interrupting because of this no, delay, not. I'm sorry. But the, the one story that, that, that teaches like a Russian is that uh, Gina Burial's brilliant story, The Stone Boy. Oh, uh, that one, yeah. I can unpack Russian stuff and that, that's a, a, a oh, yeah. classic, isn't it? Yeah, it's beautiful. North Point Press. She, I knew yeah. her a bit. She lived um, in Mill Valley when I was coming up, but, um, or Evan Cannell, who was my father's best friend and who was the first man I um, ever wanted to marry. Um, when they wrote, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> It was so quiet, you know, <laughs> like I loved Updike coming up, but it was pyrotechnic, you know, the genius was just so wild and, and showy. And, and they, the two of them, and just so many of the other, the writers of the twenties, they were, there was this quietness that you find in the Russians where you almost think not, nothing's going on. And yet all of life is going on. Go ahead. Yeah, and that writer, just to say it again, that's Gina Berrialt. And the, the story is called The Stone Boy. And I think the yeah. collection is called, isn't it called uh, Women in Their Beds, I think is the collected stories, right? Yeah. Um, well, the, no, I think it was originally The Stone Boy. And then there was a later edition of the collected works. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, everybody should read G, um, Gina Berrialt. It's B-E-R-R-I-A-U-L-T. Um, so I'm always interested, well, what I was going to say, we both have taught writing and, um, we've both written about writing now and I, and I feel like bird by bird is very nice, but it, to me, it's sort of like how I would teach my Sunday school kids how to write and compared to the, how brilliant and erudite the, um, a swim in a pond in the rain is. It's just so... But you know what, what I also came to know was that you and I could talk all weekend about writing because we basically know exactly the same thing, that it never goes I, well. I, I, let me you just, it, yeah. <laughs> it, you never- no, Let me disagree, because like, I had the same, rereading your book, I had the same thing that I just wanted to get writing again. So I think, I think um, yeah, it's never easy, that's for sure. And you're never in the mood and, um, and it never goes well. And people who think, you know, you have 19 or 20 books out that you must sit down with some confidence every morning. And I, and I say, not yet, you know, I sit down and, you know, there's that ping pong game of, of uh, grandiosity and, you know, wounded ego playing against, um, terrible self-esteem and it's going grandiosity, terrible self-esteem, <laughs> the well is run dry and always, and I bet you do this with your short stories. I think, boy, is this kicking, beating a dead horse. And, um, but I, I was yeah, made yeah. a list and I don't think I have it, of course, but um, it was all the things that you talk about that really are the very basis of writing that, that ultimately you just do it, you sit down you do it as a debt of honor. You do it by prearrangement by yourself. I'm sure, I mean, no offense. I'm sure you are unemployable too. What else would we do? 
I would like to learn to be a manicurist, but um, I'd probably have the same problems with my ego and the bad self-esteem, but you sit down and you do it. You do it at a, I do it at a certain time. You go along, you use an image in the book of, um, instead of bird by bird that you string a bead. I, I write about necklaces too and bird by bird, but you string one bead that you can see. It's like a, another way to put it would be a mosaic chip of a mural you're creating of a story or a novel. And you, you, you get to know it. You can pick up a mosaic chip or a bead, you get to know it. And that's what you do. And then you put it on the mm -hmm. cord. And then you figure out what's the next one. Yeah. And um, and then we both, I think you, everybody writes terrible first drafts. Our very, very favorite writers on, people that come to my writing workshops think that it's kind of coming through me and I'm just getting it down on paper, you know? And the only person I ever even knew about who had that experience was, Muriel Spark, who I loved when I was a young writer, Memento Mori and Prime Minister Jean Brody. And she was very religious and she felt that she had a dictaphone headset on and she was just taking dictation from God. And I always thought that was very angry. <laughs> and if you had that experience, <laughs> why would you say it out loud? But um, I assume you don't have that dictaphone experience, right? So let's talk about your process because that's what a lot of um, people here will want to hear about and um, what made you realize that this was the book you wanted to write after Lincoln? Well, I you know, I, do, I do a lot of, um, I think the, the big realization for me after I kind of shed a lot of early ideas about having to control everything and having to know what I was going to do before I started, the big breakthrough was to say that there is actually an, an intuition in us that, um, that it feels a little bit like upwelling excitement or joy uh, that you can trust. And so for this one, I'd written the Lincoln book and I knew the next fiction was gonna be stories, but when my mind went there, I was like, yeah, that'll be good, that'll be good. And then when my mind uh, to this Russian book, I got really excited and I just felt like, yeah, you better do that first. Uh, I felt like it was kind of a way of going back to the wellspring a little bit, like let's slow down a little bit stop talking so much about yourself and, and read these great works again and get re-inspired that way, you know? Um, and so really for me, the process, and this happened to me when I was about 30, I, I just had this realization that, um, you know, you have to use what you've got. And that should be, I, I think it should be somewhat enjoyable. It should be somewhat like if you were at a party or you're trying to talk yourself out of trouble or trying to seduce somebody, there's something there. It has to be something you can do reliably and you can do with some sense of fun and, and confidence. So for me, the process now is just type any old thing, as you say in, in the book, just the shitty first draft, of course. Uh, that's the antidote to writer's block, is to just say, I allow myself to write anything. Then recognize that editing and cutting and moving things around is just as much, probably more of what real writing is. Um, and then, you know, the whole thing for me is print that baby out, uh, read it the next day with somewhat of a, you know, if you can manage it, a generous spirit to yourself a little bit and a sharp pencil, and then just start editing. And for me, the whole thing is in that second where you decide yeah. to cut something or add something to not have a whole lot of concepts going at that moment. Uh, there, I mean, really, there's just um, a little thing that will show up and say, Egh, or, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, weirdly for me, that's about 95% of the game. It's just to honor that inner voice and get in better touch with it and, and not um, constantly overrule it with one's thoughts about writing or with one's plan for the book or one's agenda or political views or whatever. Just actually say, as you do, when you're staying in politics and prose and you pick up the new bestseller and you look at it and start reading, that little judgment faculty is really valuable. You know, the one that says, oh God, and throws it down or the one that makes you be standing there half an hour later still reading. So in the book, I'm kind of saying that's our best friend. You know, if we can figure out what is it in a swath of prose, ours or somebody else's, that inclines us to keep reading, you know, that's really the, like the, the million dollar question, I think. Yeah, it is. So, so I liked what you said in your book about the, I think you said the one inch window or the one inch frame. The one inch picture. That really, you can kind of, yeah, you can spare a lot of stress for yourself by just saying, I don't, 
I don't have to worry about my worldview. I just have to worry about this sentence right here. Have I, have I gotten enough of myself in a sentence? Would I stand behind it? Does it feel that horrible feeling where your sentence feels like anyone in the world could have written it, where, you know, where it doesn't have your stamp on it? If my, my, my mantra still is just worry about the smallest thing and all the, the insight that you put into that will infuse the whole book, basically, something like that, you know, yeah. approximately. Mm -hmm. um, what surprised you most about writing this book? Oh, that I fell in love with the story again, actually. I fell in love with, I, before uh, I wrote this book, I think I was too much time on the screen and I would, was reading these stories and I was kind of skimming a little bit. <clears throat> and then writing the book, I, <clears throat> I didn't really read anything but the, these stories for about a year and a half. And um, I was reading them over and over and close reading individual paragraphs. And suddenly my um, kind of like sensory synesthesia came alive again. I, I, I was in the scenes again. Uh, I could smell the horse, the master and man and all that kind of stuff. And then weirdly, when I, this last teaching semester, I think was one of the best I've ever had. I felt like I could really, the, writing the book had helped me teach better. And then now I'm finding that I'm suddenly kind of um, having a lot of story uh, notions. They're, they're coming pretty quickly. So I think there was some kind of indirect effect of this, you know, slowing down and really uh, immersing myself in these great masters. It really, really helped, surprisingly. I didn't, I didn't think that would happen, but it, it, it has. Mm -hmm. And also, press a lot more now. You can see. See that? Yeah. I was, gonna, I wondered because it, the book flows so easily when it's really about such rich material from the Russians and also from your very heart and your experience and your both life your inner life as a writer and, and your obvious love for the students you've worked with for 20 years um what was the hardest part of the book to get right it flows it um it's full of heart it's full of soul it's a spiritual book and but it's also sort of te technical it's like do this um write start where you are you know the buddhists would say like start where your butt is or words to that effect and you have flannery o'connor said that if you've survived childhood you have plenty to write about for the rest of your life and you start where you are and you write a little tiny bit of it and it'll go badly and then write another one or make it better but what was the hardest part of the whether it's the the tone I, the tone i thought must have thrown you a number of times what was the hardest part? Yeah, for me, the hardest part was that I um, I knew I had 15 stories I wanted to teach, and then it became clear that I could only pick six or seven. So then it was a matter of of making the essays um, not repeat themselves. You know, so I had the idea that the essays would kind of make an overstory that was sort of escalatory in its own way and and um, uh, proceeded as a story might. So that meant a lot of rewriting of sections and moving things around. Uh, so that, that was really the hardest part. And then there's another little hurdle where, you know, I, I taught these stories for about 20 years. So I thought, oh, it'll be so easy. I'll just type up my notes, you know. And then you, you after the first draft, you, I hit the wall and went, oh, my God, this is not, there's nothing here yet. So that the, the realization that I was going to have to go beyond uh, my understanding that I taught with and actually really open them up. That was such a delight, you know, to, to do it. And then to find out that I could, you know, and that there, um, these stories have been speaking to me all these years because they really are great, you know. Uh, but I think the order was probably the, the hardest thing, because if you know, it's it's almost like I felt the um, the the readers would be exhausted if I repeated a uh, a bit of concept on too many times. So to get them in the right order, where you could just touch on each thing and then the thing, the, the whole effect would be to build over the over the length of the book. That was the hardest part. But again, the answer to that is just doing it a whole, whole bunch of times and you know, going through the book from start to finish over and over and over. Mm -hmm. um, I know that um, everybody wants to know what your actual process is. And then we'll move on to um, audience questions because God, my experience is that their questions are just magical. But um, what's, what, do you, what does it look like when you're on, on a weekday when you're in the middle of something? What, how do you write? Um, I've 
Yeah, usually I've kind of got three, like right now upstairs, I've got three little piles of three different stories that are at different places. Um, and then really, I just kind of go up there and see if any of them is sort of saying, I want to, you know, pick me today. If, you know, if it feels, uh, if I feel excited to work about on something and there's just a slight feeling like there's an obligatory feeling. And then there's a genuine feeling of kind of fun. This would be fun. So I usually pull that story forward. And honestly, I just kind of start reading it and um, with, with a pencil in hand. And then uh, I, I, you know, one of the things I say in the book is that people who like the, the 234 people who are in the audience, you're there because you have a particularly beautiful, strong relation to language. You, that's what you do, you know, probably has been like that since you were a kid. So that's actually the, the superpower. And, you know, if you, if you pull forward a bit, a bit of text or you, you drive by a highway sign or, you know, someone sends you a letter, you know, you have a strong opinion about prose probably, you know, the odds are good. So I rely on that. I'm a real snob, you know, when it comes to written language. So I just pull my own story forward and start scanning it. And uh, almost immediately I have opinions, you know, and in the book I say, there's like a little meter in your, meter in your head and this is positive, this is negative. So I feel like my whole job is to be very alert to the micro fluctuations in that meter. Am I pleased or am I a little bit not pleased? Um, and then at the same time, kind of really quickly saying, is there anything to do about it today? Sometimes there is, and I try to do it. And other times you go, no, I, I, don't, I don't have anything. And one of the key things is to not go beyond that point, you know, because if you, if you don't have a strong intuitive reaction uh, to it, you'll start thinking about it. And to me, that's death, you know, when you say, okay, I don't know, but I should probably do this, then you're going to mess it up. So really, that's it. I just go through, you know, the three or four pages I have done. And usually, there aren't, aren't so many ideas at the beginning, but then as I get down, it gets a little messier. And then at some point, it's just, you know, a big mess. Uh, then I try to, um, as you talk about in your book, and so beautifully, be gentle with myself, like, okay, yeah, there's a lot wrong with this. There's no ending. But it's okay. Just give yourself a chance. Um, and then I go back to the top and just very kind of ritually enter in those changes on, on the word processor, really enjoying that. Uh, and then print it out again. And really, that's about it. You know, just do that. And I can usually do that maybe four times a day before I start to get a little hazy. Um, <clears throat> and then I guess in, implicit in that is the idea that you don't have to stop until you want to. You know, I can do that. I have stories that I worked on for 12 years. Um, so it's kind of rinse, lather, repeat with the, the patience that says, you know, I, I remember going to a, a songwriting seminar with this guy, Mike Smith, uh, back before I had published anything. He wrote a beautiful song called The Dutchman, uh, which Steve Goodman recorded. And he would just go into somebody's house in Rochester and put on this little seminar for $50 or something. And he said this beautiful thing. He said, when he's writing a song, when he's finished, he'll, he'll take it. <clears throat> And he'll compare it to the work of one of his masters. So he used Dylan as an example. And everybody in the room groaned like, oh, my God. He said, no, it's OK. You, you, you play your song, you play Dylan's, and then gently, you just very quietly say, what's the difference? You know, what's the difference? And he said, you don't have to answer it. You don't have to get defensive. But you can sometimes feel the difference. Um, and he said that's a practice that he, he did his whole life, was just to always keep the, the bar high. Um, and then along with that is the idea that you might not be able to write a song in that ballpark yet, but patience, you know, patience and a little bit of self-generosity, who knows what, what might happen. So that's the kind of spirit I write in, like, yeah, this story is a mess, but in the past when I persisted until I was satisfied, something good would happen. Um, and then that combined with the kind of natural OCD, you know, it's kind of a, uh, you know, um, counterbalancing forces, I guess. Does that sound about like what you do? Yeah, uh, you write for longer than I do, but yeah. um, you know, I always told my students to send money to the Sierra Club and Greenpeace and print over print out, print out whenever you, whenever you think <laughs> you, because for me, I grew up on, you know, you remember correcto type and then the miracle of whiteout in, in our thirties, but um, 
it was all about paper. I grew up, the reason I became a writer was because of the paper, because of what happens for a little girl holding a book and in a world that springs out of those two dimensional pages, a whole world into which I could get completely lost. This scared, odd little child could get completely lost. And I kept getting found and I kept wanting more and more and more and more. And then I wanted to do it. And um, so, um, the paper is so sacred to me, not to sound too over, overly dramatic, but hence a pencil scratching across paper, the scritch, scritch, scritch of a pencil on paper to me is a sacred sound. And it connects us to all of the writers who came before and all of the writers who will come after us who maybe felt a little encouraged, but because we, we told the truth, we said, you know, we never really know what we're doing till we finished the first draft. And, and it always is very disappointing. And sometimes it's sort of scary, and, but we keep doing it and, um, and it gets a little better. And then people help us, editors help us, your wife, my husband, my couple friends are readers and, and it becomes collaborative and, and it gets better. And that's, that's the, what you hope for. But um, so, mm -hmm. I, you know, if, I just, I love paper, I love printout. I, I'm, I'm a wash in paper. If you were here, you would feel worried for me because there's just so much paper because that's the sacred part of writing is the scritch, scritch, scritch. Now, one last question, then let's I also, question. go ahead. Now, I was just gonna say too, that, that one of the things that I've really loved about learning to revise is that you, um, you know, when you first, the first draft that we're talking about is, you know, it's kind of the way that we think in real life. You see somebody, you make certain assumptions about them, certain projections, and, and then you proceed. But in writing, I always feel like time gets to slow down a little bit and you get to re-examine that first um, impression. Uh, yeah. Mostly, and it's weird because mostly you're doing it by checking out the sentences you wrote about her. Is this true? Am I being a little biased? Am I overlooking something in her? And I think some of the great stories in, in literature are ones that start in that position of a uh, quick judgment. You know, reader and writer are both quickly judging somebody. And then the story exists to kind of show us that we have the capability to look closer at people and they can open themselves up to us. And so, uh, for example, in that Chekhov story, Lady with Pet Dog, you know, there's this guy, Gurov, who's kind of a playboy, basically, he's a serial cheater. And uh, the story and the we kind of look down on him and the, you know, the, the whole story basically is asking, could he change, you know, and by association, can anybody change, you know? Uh, so I love that part about it, you know, that you, I, I'm, I'm instructed in the fact that my first impressions are usually facile and they have a lot of my personality in them and a lot of my habits, which I don't particularly love. But then by reworking something, I find that I have depths, you know, depths, more love, more um, patience, uh, more ambiguity, uh, and by the end of a, a story, even about a really terrible person that I'm writing, I kind of love the person if we define love as I've been attentive to him, you know, and that, that I don't know to what extent that actually gets out into real life, but I think it kind of does. I think there have certainly been times where I felt myself judging somebody quickly and then kind of a shadow of my rewriting hat will come up and say, hey, 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 you're, you're thinking in first draft way. Uh, give it a little, give it a little time, you know, so that's been kind of a, a nice thing about writing. Um, well, the Old Testament writer said, refers to deep calling to deep, like one person mm. calling to the, to the galaxy or one person not running for their life when somebody starts to confuse or, or bore them, but going deeper and deeper and deeper and going deeper into ourselves. As you say, is this true? No, but it's just so kicky the way I wrote it it's such a great little line you know and then the ultimate line on um editing and revising I think is Jessica Midford saying you must kill your little darlings and I have to do a whole draft where I go through and I cut the stuff that I just thought was so witty and so brilliant and just total bullshit like I have to let out the dog I'll be right back go. Go. Okay. Okay. Everybody. Um, Thank you for being here. No, okay. <laughs> I'm back. Okay, last thing. Um, you've talked about, you've said, you've written the part of the mind that reads the story is also the part that reads the world. 
Can you talk us through that idea? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of what we were just saying that, you know, you, um, you, you, you go into this world and I think that the mind that we have and the sensory apparatus that we have is basically designed to help us survive. And so, you know, quickly from the time you can remember, you've made a, a, a self that's you, that you really like, and you don't really believe that the world existed before that person showed up. And you kind of feel like the whole world is a show being put on for you. That's all totally natural. But it's also, as we, you know, we find out at the end, it's, it's delusional. You, you actually weren't that important or, or that permanent. So um, we, we're always reading the world. The, the world is actually this huge novel that we're kind of reading all the time. Uh, but we don't necessarily read it that well. You know, we're, we're just picking little snippets and assembling a, a, a meaning for ourselves. So um, when we read a story and, and, I, and whether we're writing that story or whether someone else has written it, we get a chance to see what the mind does with it. You know, so in other words, if you're reading a story, you'll see that your mind will quickly make an allegiance to somebody or your mind will quickly make an aversion to somebody. That's exactly what it does out in the real world. Uh, and as we in story world, then we get to slow down a little bit. And somebody like Chekhov or Tolstoy has made a kind of scale model of things. And in a certain way, the design to out that initial uh, um, simple mind, you know, to say, oh, no, 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 no. When you judge this character on page one, you really weren't doing deep to deep. You know, you were using your usual mind. So when we, we read a story, we are actually, it's in a sense, it's kind of meditative because what we're really doing is we're looking at uh, our own mind. How does our mind interpret words on the page? What kind of moral assumptions do we make? What conclusions do we leap to? Uh, and then often in these great stories, the, the writer is there to guide us up to the next level, you know, the next level of, of I would say, love or patience or whatever. So I think, you know, for me, the, the you know, but this is, I wrote this book, uh, you know, during the Trump years, uh, was finishing it through the pandemic and then was finishing it when all these terrible race, racist murders took place. And sometimes I would say, why am I writing about these Russians right now, you know? But, the, but every day I'd go out there and concentrate on a little bit of text. And the comfort that I got was that my mind was pretty good, you know? My mind could discern cause and effect. My mind could move toward truth. Uh, my mind was not insane, actually. You know, when I, when I was reading these stories, my mind was not um, disassociative or, or angry. So in a way, I felt like I was kind of just warming myself over this little fire of, of uh, logic, kind of trying to strengthen myself to go back out into the bigger world. And I think that's what books do. You know, they remind us that connection is not an abstraction. You know, when, you, when you're reading Master and Man by Tolstoy and you you have to stop because you tear up. That guy Tolstoy, who didn't even speak your language, he's connecting with you. You're something in common has been enlightened. That in itself, I think, is so encouraging. You know, we're not alone. We're not alone at any time. Anything that you go through that's disastrous and terrible, somebody's been through it. Uh, that's an amazing kind of you know neural network actually that transcends time and space and language and all of that. So that's a long-winded answer, but something like that. Yeah. Here's a really good question from the audience. These are just brilliant. Um, from Jake, can writing moralistically acquit you of amoral behavior? I'm thinking of Tolstoy here, or is it a cop out? Yeah. I think they're both true. You know, you could be a deeply moral writer and a real stinker. I think that's true, you know, and um, I, I'm not sure. I certainly don't think that writing well makes you a better person I think I know lots of really good people who aren't good writers. So I think I think in a way you have to kind of leave that open. Um, yeah, I think that's you just have to leave it open. And for in Tolstoy's case, uh, you know, he wasn't a murderer, but he was a pretty bad husband apparently, and you know that. I, I think you have to kind of appreciate the work as a separate entity from the person, maybe. And also, I think we have to also discourage the idea that you sometimes see that being a bad person makes you a better writer. You know, being a uh, an abusive, big drinker, wild person. It, it, there's almost no connection. And that was one of the things I learned, you know, when I studied with Toby Wolf at Syracuse, he's such a lovely person. I don't know if you know him, man. Oh, I love but a book. lovely, strong mm. person. And he's a crazy writer as well. And so those two things are, I'm sure they speak to each other, 
but he he doesn't uh, he, he's out of control out of control in the most beautiful way on the page and in control in the most beautiful way in his life. So for me, that's the role model. Um, yeah, I don't I don't think yeah. I'll, but Tolstoy, I'll take I'll take. I'll take him as I get him, you know, with those, those stories. Oh yeah, whatever. Um, I have about six questions here um, about how your Buddhist practice affects your work. Are you able to talk about that now? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I should say I'm really a beginner. You know, I know people who aren't and I really am. So I, I probably talk about it more than I should given my, my level of uh, accomplishment. But I would just say, um, Two, well, maybe two things. One is I notice when I'm when I'm practicing more, I become aware of a of a kind of auto negativity that I've had since I was a little kid. Kind of a snarky, sarcastic. It's kind of fun, but it's a little bit negative. I just become aware of it, and sometimes when you become aware of it, you can choose the way from it. So that's been a real benefit. Um, and then the second thing is I just notice as I get older that they're not they're different, but they're not that different. In in the way I was talking about earlier, when you're writing, your job is to be in the moment that it actually is, as opposed to the one you hoped it was, which I think is true in life as well. So the meditative aspect would be to say, I'm going to really try to see what my story is doing, even if I don't like it. I'm gonna just really be open to the actual energy coming off the story uh, with the confidence that I can work with it. And I think there's a parallel in, you know, in, in, in life that you can, you can get your projections to be quiet, you know, you get more data coming in and then you can see the moment you're actually living in. But that, that would be about the, you know, I think meditation is amazing. And it, um, for me, it's really opened the world up. And so I just kind of trust that if I pursue that, it'll, it'll come into the writing eventually, you know, so and I'm sure that's true of any spiritual practice, you know. Mm -hmm. Someone asked down below that they know that you really love music. And I wonder in the same way, let's see, here mm -hmm. it is, Jonathan. Um, you just made reference to a songwriting workshop you took. It's clear that music is important to you. I wonder how you feel your experience of music and songwriting finds its way into the rhythms of your writing process. That's a great question. That's, that's a really perceptive. Yeah, it, it, I, I say it definitely does. I'm not exactly sure how, but when I'm, when I'm reading a sentence that I've written, it's very much you know, about rhythm and kind of uh, the, the, the uh, where the truncation should be and where the expansion should be, which I think comes from music. I'll tell you a story that's kind of a weird one. Um, when I was young, I, I had, I was a working class kid. I really thought that if you were a classical guitar player, you were unassailable. You know, if you could play classical guitar, nobody could, could touch you. So I went to the community college and took a lesson from this guy. And I'd learned this piece, this really hard piece called Capriccio Arabe. It's a classical kind of masterpiece. And I, but I'd learned it from the record and a little bit from the sheet music. And uh, I went into this guy and I just played the hell out of it. It was the best I'd ever played it, you know, and I was so proud and I was just sure he was going to take me on as his, as his student, you know, and praise me. And he, he took a really long pause. And then he said, he said, if you don't change the way you're living, you're going to be a very unhappy adult. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why? What I was expecting, but he was saying to me in a kind of an unskillful way, "You're a sloppy. You're you're uh, you're skimming over that song. You're not really paying attention to the notes. You're just trying to get through it without making a mistake." And I, of course, for years I just resented him. But then when I started writing, I thought, "Oh my God, that was really a lesson." You know, you you can't just do a thing to appear to be doing the thing. You know, you, you have to really uh, recognize when you're playing a song, you're trying to make a beautiful note so somebody will hear. It. Uh, that's all about communication. And as I say in the book, it, it, what we're doing really is trying to make an intimate communication between us and the audience, which is a really profound thing to do. It's not really uh, necessarily in our nature. You know, we want to talk down to somebody and command them. But in all these art forms, you, you know, you have to trust that the listener or the reader is every bit as smart as you are. So he gave me that lesson and I wasn't really ready to hear it at that point. I just quit basically. But um, I, I sometimes think about trying to find him and, and, uh, I don't know if I thank them exactly, but but yeah, I like to play music, and also I I the, the deepest lesson is that I'm not that good at it. I love it, uh, but when I get to the moment of truth in a song, I don't have a real uh, strong opinion the way that one would need to. I think to be a great songwriter with prose, I get to a moment I have totally I have a very strong opinion, uh, mm -hmm. and with songs I can always t touch 
that moment when my something, my skill or my passion kind of goes, I don't know, just whatever, you know, and that's not a, for an artist to say, I don't know, whatever is not a good, not a good thing. Yeah. Well, you try something and it, I, I, I talked to this fabulous elderly paint, painter once in upstate New York and he did big canvases and he said what he did was he'd just try one, the upper right hand quadrant and he'd paint what he could see of his internal vision and he paint and it wouldn't be right at all. And so he covered up with white paint and he'd, he'd do it again. It still wouldn't be right. But each time he did it, he got a little bit closer to what he was after, had been after all along. And I find that happens a lot in my own right. writing. Here's a good yeah, you question. Have to, you have to try to know how to, yeah. Well, you go. Um, you're breaking up, but um, I, I guess the bad people will come for us with crooks when they want us to stop, right? I think it's it's almost time, but I have several more questions. Um, here's, I love this question from Maria Brakel. If someone is intimidated by, and then all caps, the Russians, where should they start? Um, I would start with, um, let's see. Actually, I think I think the first story in the book, in the cart, is a real sweetheart yeah. of story. It's very, um, you know, it works on a real basic emotional level. Just a, you know, a lonely girl on a trip, and uh, you know, I think a lot of people think that the Russians are intimidating, but I find them so. Um, the, the stories are so centered around people, you know, and they're especially on their inner life, and uh, that's where I connect with them. Where you know, this woman is, she's just a teacher. She's kind of overworked, and she, she's lonely, and she's past the point where her life can change and she's got to go into town one more time to pick up her check, you know, and you're, and immediately that most important thing in fiction is your heart goes out to her, you know, you suddenly you, you care about this, this complete invention from that point on Chekhov has you, you know, yeah. and I think in each, actually in each one of these seven stories, there's a moment where suddenly you find yourself caring about this person who's in the story. And, you know, it's something, I guess we don't talk about that much in MFA, but, if I can get you to care about a person, even a little bit, you know, and we, and we, we like to care about people, then that really is the basis for storytelling. You know, if I, if I tell you a few things about, Steve, you know, Steve's a really nice guy who always talks too softly and he's terrified of being humiliated in public because it happened to him once when he was five. I tell you that much about little Steve, you know, uh, and also Steve has a small scar right above his eye right here that he's very shy about. So he often will talk to you like this. There's Steve. Okay. Now, Steve gets into an elevator. Already, we're primed for something to be something bad to happen to Steve, you know, and already we feel kind of protective of Steve, you know, so the story has started to tell itself. And I think the Russians, especially in the car, they, they kind of work that way, you know, they're very simple, really, you know, that's the hardest thing to do is uh, a simple story that we care about is really, that's the gold standard, you know. Mm -hmm. And in that first story, what's the woman's name, Maria or Maria? Um, anyway, when- Yeah, Maria. Maria, her, she's gone to, she had a kind of nightmare road uh, trip into town. She's seen what she's been seeing every day for 20 years. She's going back to a life that's really dull and without love. And she's kind of failed in, a, in relational ways. And, um, and yet she has this a very quiet, soft epiphany that to me i i read it as this sort of self-forgiveness you know it just was what it was the flour and the sugar were mm. were wrecked by the bad driving of the the carriage driver and she hadn't found love with the man who she was driving alongside briefly and she wasn't probably ever going to find love but she was going to back going back to this tiny little house and because of the hardest work we do of self-forgiveness, you felt intuitively that she was a slightly different woman than the woman who had left for town that morning. Yeah. And I think that's maybe what all short yeah. stories yeah. are about. That the person right. is different than yeah. the Yeah, that little miraculous of her mom. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. has that beautiful little vision of her, yeah. a false vision of her mom. And she yeah. remembers who she used to be. So, so yeah. amazing. Yeah. And she has a moment of love for herself. I mean, wild for her to have that. To see. Anyway, one last question. Um, this is a really good question. And I think we all want to know. Um, 
Oh, but now I've lost it, but it's about how, or, okay, Katie Van Sant, earlier you said not to let the plan agenda political views get in the way. On the other hand, that sounds liberating, but on the other hand, at this particular time in the history of our country, it feels very difficult to do and perhaps even wrong in a way. Can you speak to writing fiction? Not just in these times, but this week. Yeah, now that's a brilliant question. And I, and I think about it all the time. Here's what I've concluded for myself is that the story form works in a certain way. Um, I don't think it works that well when I have a political idea and I use it to tell you about it because uh, maybe just because of the form itself, it, it, somehow it's not built for that. So my thought is I'm gonna try to immerse myself in politics and have strong feelings and be a righteous person you know, um, on these things. And I'm gonna trust that those feelings will somehow or another come out into my work in an appropriate way. Uh, and I have this feeling partly because in the past when I've had a strong political view and tried to use a story to express it, it's never really worked. Or at best, it's, be, it's a facile kind of a little flag wave that nobody would believe. So I think the story form is actually higher than politics in the sense that it um, it opens us up into our full human capability. And from that position, we're much better political people. We're, we're letting more data in. We're more courageous. We're more um, curious. Uh, so that's been my the way I tell it to myself. Now, the other thing is there's a beautiful Chekhov story called Grief, uh, which I think is in maybe the best kind of political story. It's real simple. It's just this guy uh, is a really um, poor uh, cab driver, a horse, horse-drawn carriage driver. And he's going about his business, really tough life. And we find out that that day his son has died, but he still had to come to work. So he's working and he's grieving. And all he wants is to tell one person about, he just wants a little bit of sympathy from anybody, but nobody will have it because he's just a cab driver. He's not just shut up. One guy actually hits him and tells him to be quiet. So at the end of the story in which he's got no relief whatsoever, he goes into um, uh, the stable and he just kind of puts his head against the horse and he says, I had a son, you know. Now on the surface, that's not a political story except it speaks volumes about the revolution that's coming. Uh, so for me, I aspire to write that kind of story. If a story is about a human being's sorrow or suffering or aspirations, and I think it's implicitly political. Unfortunately, in a time like ours, which is so sped up, you know, everybody wants to write, in my case, I'd love to write the anti-Trump story. But I felt when I tried to do that, that the forum was pushing back and saying, you know, actually, I'm not made for that. Go, go write an essay. Um, but again, it's a great question. I think we should all be asking it for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the bad people want us to stop. But um, I have a perfect way to end this. Mm -hmm. I, it's only three minutes at the most. And it's a reading. There's Bradley. He looks very sweet. I'm trying um, not to look like the bad person. Looks like a good person. But go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, well, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want this book, if you know, if you're a writer, if you know a writer, get him this book, because you can read these Russian stories with a tour guide, and, and you can see in, in stories where not that much seems to happen, all of life happens, all of eternity in a blade of grass happens, but the title is about the rain, and I want to read you this paragraph from um, the story, the title story. Um, the rain functions in the story like a side character. It continues to fall as the men bathe in the pond, then disappears until the story's last line when it makes a final appearance. The rain beat against the window panes all night. Rain has been a source of unhappiness as they hike, a source of happiness falling on them as they swam in the pond, and now provides a persistent, low-level, nagging reminder of well, something. To be in touch with the complex beauty of the story, try writing out what it is that the rain is reminding you of, or saying to you, or representing, as it taps on the window there at the end. It's not just one thing, it's many things at once, and it's personal. Even if I could articulate my answer, I've tried several times and each time have deleted the result, finding it reductive and insufficient. 
my answer would not be yours precisely. Luckily, we don't have to say. That's part of why the story was written, to produce that irreducible final moment about which nothing more needs to be said. So beautiful, George, and such a great honor to be with you, my new friend. And yeah, thank you so thank much you. for doing that. I love meeting you. I love meeting you. And thank you, Bradley, and all the, the young people at Politics and Prose. Well, George and Anne, this has been such an thank insightful you. and instructive discussion. I, I, I think we'll just post this video online uh, under the heading, when to write, you, you absolutely must re watch this, you know. Um, to everyone watching this evening, uh, thanks again for tuning in. Uh, remember, you can, you can find a link in the chat column to purchase more copies of George's uh, new book, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain. And also there is a link to pre-order uh, Anne's forthcoming book, Dusk, Night, Dawn. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read.